I think I will use this some tonight because when we're going to be out on the battlefield over the next three days, uh, it'll it'll certainly uh, strain our voices some, especially with a group this big. Uh, I talked to Ed, Ed Barr just a little earlier at uh, dinner, and I thought Ed's voice was already weak this evening, so hopefully he won't lose his voice. I've actually been with Ed when he suffered from laryngitis. And uh, yeah, yeah, it actually happened. Yeah, it actually happened. There we go. Here we go. Here comes here comes here they come. Here we go. Come on, Kurt. Good morning. Good morning. He's been driving for a while. Yeah. Janet got lost, huh? Oh, well. She looked before I did. How many of these people do you know? You know all these folks? I know most of these people. You know most of them? Yeah. <laughs> now, you told me earlier you had been on how many tours consecutively since? 1985. Since 1985, I haven't missed a tour. Yeah. So let's see, 85, 95, how many years is that? Uh, 28. 28 years. I can still count. All right, who's going to top 28? Consecutive. How many, Gary? Oh, I missed one since 1982. One since 1982. That's great. Anybody else? Top set. Yes, sir. I missed two since 1971. Wow. <laughs> Which two did you miss? Gettysburg and North Carolina. Both because of family illnesses. Well, you didn't miss anything in Gettysburg, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> North Carolina, that was criminal to miss that one, but Gettysburg. Uh, and of course, Marshall's, Marshall's not in here yet, but I suspect Marshall probably, does he hold the record at least of all the people that are here? Well, Ed, 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 Marshall, how many, how many of these things have you attended over the years? What's the total number? Forty-five. Forty-five. That's older than I am, Marshall. <laughs> That's more years than I have in me. It's older than me, Actually, I just told a lie. I am over 45 now. Not when I first met him, though. And uh, let's see. Bars has done how many of these now? How many How many consecutive years has he led? I think it's about 48. 48. Yeah, 48. I'll tell you a quick Ed Bars story. Of course, all of you have Ed Bars stories. Yeah. Um, but um, when Mark called me almost two years ago uh, and said, hey, uh, we're going to do the Maryland campaign, and he said, we're going to do it in 2013. The first thing I said is, why are you doing the Maryland campaign in 2013? Especially when the 150th anniversary was in 2012. That just was completely um, puzzling to me. And he said, well, we already got something set up for 2012. Where were you last year? Chickamauga? Chattanooga. Ch Ch Chattanooga, Chickamauga last year. It's already set up, so we're going to do it. We're going to do Antietam and Maryland campaign in 2013. Okay, well, fine. And... Um, He's talking about the places he'd like to go, as any tour coordinator would, and he's going on and on over the telephone now for about 25 minutes. <laughs> that is true. That is true. And um, he had not once mentioned Ed Barge during this time. Now, I knew that Ed had been the guy for the Civil War Roundtable for the longest time. And so I was getting a little concerned at my home that I had not heard any mention of Edwin C. Bars at this point. And I'm actually thinking to myself, I am not going to do this tour because I am not going to be the first guy to supplant <laughs> Ed Bars. <laughs> Wasn't going to happen. So uh, finally, I said to Mark, uh, hey, uh, you haven't mentioned Ed Bars at all. Uh, is he going to be the guy? And there was this long, long silence. And I thought, here it comes. Mark's going to tell me that Ed will not be the guy. And that's what I was prepared to hear. So finally, there was this little crackling noise at the other end of the phone. And he said, are you crazy? Of course Ed's going to be the guy. <laughs> and I started to just laugh. I just laughed almost with hysterical laughter because I realized that we're only about uh, six weeks, six, seven weeks from Ed's 90th birthday. 
Uh, and so the very idea that we're going to be out here for the next three and a half days uh, with Ed at 90 years, almost 90 years old, I told my park superintendent today as I bid her adieu uh, to get ready to do these tours, I said, you know, by Sunday afternoon, two guides will be finished with this tour. One will be dragging, the other will be ready to go the next day. <laughs> I'll be the one that will be dragging. <laughs> and Ed will be ready to go off to the next tour on Monday. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be with you, excited about it, but thinking about this. Uh, you're, you, of course, are the Civil War Roundtable. I remember I joined the Hagerstown Civil War Roundtable here. I'm a native of this area. This is home. Um, I joined the Hagerstown Roundtable when I was eight years old. Uh, the Hagerstown Roundtable is rather young compared to you. Uh, you were already 16 years old. You were already in your adolescence when the Hagerstown Roundtable was formed in 1956. I wasn't even born yet. But uh, when I did join the Hagerstown Roundtable at age eight, and I've been a member ever since, um, my dream was to someday, at some point, speak to the Chicago Civil War Roundtable, speak to the Civil War Roundtable. Because for me, as a young man, that represented the pinnacle of my career. After I did that, nothing else was important. So that is, I literally became an aspiration, was to speak to the Chicago Roundtable. And um, little did I know that uh, as a real young man, I would meet uh, Merle and Pat Sumner. Uh, Merle had uh, been a president of the round table. Something, Pat, as I recall, was the first woman president of the Chicago round table. And uh, we met on a campaigning with Lee seminar with Bud Robertson in 1982. And I was fresh out of college and fresh into the National Park Service at Harper's Ferry as a uh, park historian. Uh, and um, in January of 1983, when I was only 22 years old, I was speaking before the Chicago Civil War Roundtable, age 22. I reached the pinnacle at age 22. <laughs> uh, what can I do after that? I, I, met, I met Marshall Krillick at age 22. Ralph was there that night. Ralph Newman was there that night. I met Ralph Newman, the founder of the movement, that night. And so uh, I, don't, I think I might still hold the record as the youngest speaker ever at the Chicago Roundtable. I'm not, I mean, I'm not certain of that as an outsider, not from Chicago, but, but uh, I'm, I think I may hold that record. Uh, which I'm, I'm very proud, very, very proud to have that if that is the case. So anyway, welcome to my backyard, welcome to my home here in Washington County and in Western Maryland. And uh, incidentally, in Washington County, there are uh, 39 Washington counties in the United States, but this particular one is very unique because the Washington County that you are in is the very first Washington County in the United States. Numero uno. And let me tell you something, the founding fathers of this county, they had real, I'll be a little parochial and a little crude, they had real balls. Because when they founded this county, it was in 1776. And let me tell you something, there was no greater traitor on the North American continent in 1776 than George Washington. So they named this county after Washington in 1776 as Washington literally was racing with his army in retreat on Long Island. It did not look good for the revolutionaries. So I give my founding fathers here in Washington County a lot of credit. My family was actually here in this county dating to the 1760s and so they were part of the treason that <laughs> occurred here uh, when this county was established in 1776. Um, of course as it turned out uh, the traitors won, and uh, Washington County survived, and we still claim, of course, today the earliest uh, county in the United States named after the father of our country. So welcome to Washington County. Um, I'm going to give you one advertisement brought to you by. Uh, before we begin this evening, I'm not going to speak long because you're going to have some very long days ahead of you, and I know that after a day, I've been doing this a long time, I've been speaking, I've been public speaking for close to 45 years. You don't talk very long when people have had dinner, 
and traveled to get to a certain place. So this is not going to be a long-winded presentation this evening. I'm only going to hit a couple of high points that I want you to consider that hopefully will provoke you as we go over the next few days. So this is not going to be a bricks and mortar, move by move, maneuver talk. We'll, tell, we'll do that for you on the battlefield. I believe since we're going to be on the resource where the battle occurred, where the maneuvers occurred, we could show you where they happened rather than in a room like this, an artificial setting where I can tell you about them. We'll be standing where they happened. But brought to you by this presentation tonight and tomorrow is brought to you by what's called the Harpers Ferry Historical Association. Now, I don't work for them, I work for the National Park Service. I work at Harpers Ferry National Park, I'm the chief historian there. But the Harpers Ferry Historical Association is the nonprofit organization that supports our national park. And what I'm going to ask all of you to do tomorrow when we're in Harpers Ferry is to support that nonprofit. And believe me, today we need the support more than ever. The sequester is very real. In all my years, over 30 years of working for the federal government, I've never seen anything like we are experiencing presently. The cuts exist, and they are painful. And since we're not the air traffic controllers, we don't get our sequester problem fixed. And so the association literally donates to the National Park to allow us to do many of the programs that we do and we are going to be leaning on them more than ever. So I'm making a plea to you this evening. I'm basically giving you my time tonight. I'm going to be giving you my time over the next couple of days, and I'm happy to do that, very happy and honored to do that. But I'm hopeful that you will see amongst yourselves and have the opportunity to give back to our nonprofit. And what I mean by that is take a couple of souvenirs home with you. In other words, we have a great bookstore. <laughs> the association runs our bookstore, and it is a fabulous National Park bookstore. It is really exceptional. We have, and I kid you not, 20 times more books in our bookstore than the Antina Battlefield bookstore. 20 times more books. Okay? So you're going to visit basically two bookstores on this trip, at least while you're with me and Ed. And if you really want some books, you're going to have to get them tomorrow morning. There's three I want to call specific attention to. One is, this, and these just came out, so I can almost guarantee you most of you do not have these in your library. I suspect almost none of you have this in your library. This is pretty much hot off the press. It came out in 2012. Uh, nationally, won a national award, incidentally, um, just recently. Uh, among all the public lands, organization, nonprofits in the United States, and there's hundreds of them, this was the best book in the country, put together by a public lands organization. This book was published by the Harpers Ferry Historical Association. So if you buy this book, which deals with Harpers Ferry during the Civil War, it's called Harpers Ferry Under Fire. It comes in both hardback and in paperback. There's 200 illustrations in here. If you don't like to read, at least you can look at the pictures. <laughs> and the good news about Harpers Ferry is we've got lots of pictures. Harpers Ferry is very photogenic. And it was photogenic in 1861 through 1865. So a lot of those pictures appear in here. But if you pick this book up tomorrow, and the only place you can get it is at our bookstore, because they don't sell it anywhere else, um, you will be helping our organization, our nonprofit. So they'll have it there for you. Um, and I, I encourage it. Take a chance to take a look at it. Another thing they'll have there, and some of you do have this because when I spoke to the round table last year, you were the first to see this. This book, which is called September Suspense, Lincoln's Union in Peril, came out on June the 1st, 2012. I was in Chicago that week, and you in Milwaukee and Kenosha were the first to see this. It literally was hot into my hands, right out of the press. Um, they'll have September Suspense there tomorrow also. This deals with this period in history, and um, it's, it's a very, very different type of book in that it focuses not so much on the military maneuvers, but on the, the grand strategy as the military likes to talk about it. And as I was writing about Antietam, I was trying to put together something that nobody else had previously written about that wouldn't be a repetition of other people's works so that you wouldn't have this as just some other repeat of something you already have in your library. So September Suspense depends principally upon primary sources 
like 1862 newspapers that help tell the story. So they'll have that there tomorrow. And I know Gordy Dahman will give you a good advertisement on September's suspense because I know he and Karen really liked it. Liked and you're book. too modest and you just won an award for that book. Please. Yep, we just won, a, yeah. just won a national award for September suspense. We won the, uh, the Laney Prize, which is um, uh, given by uh, the Austin Civil War Roundtable, named after uh, one of their presidents and founding members, uh, Dan Laney. And um, there were 35 books in competition, all 2012 publications in September suspense won the competition. So I just heard about that last week. That's great. Book. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate it. So they'll have that one there, too, if for anybody who's interested. Now, here's, here's the real deal. F, F, I got something that's free. That's a great four-letter word, free. If, if any of you do this tomorrow, this is going to be Scouts on. But if any of you go into our bookstore at Harpers Ferry tomorrow morning, and you'll have time to spend a little time looking around Harpers Ferry, the town, too. But if you spend some time in the bookstore and you buy the uh, Harpers Ferry Under Fire book, and you buy September Suspense, which will be a lot of money for the bookstore, this you'll get free. I'll give this to you. Now, they won't give it to you. But I'll give it to you. Not, I won't be able to do it right there in the National Park, but I'll take care of it. Um, I'll take care of it. And so uh, this book came out. I really enjoyed putting this together. This came out, I think, about 2004. Um, it's, a, it's a really neat uh, primer on uh, the whole campaign. Um, I, I put this together never to be a book, but as my own little cheat sheet to help me try to remember things because there's so much we're trying to remember all the time, and you can't. And so I started to write all this down, and various people, I started to share it with people, uh, my friends who were doing other tours and wanted the same information, and they finally talked me into writing a book about it. So that became Antietam Revealed. I know Gordy and the guides use this all the time as one of their, uh, I'll use a strong word, one of their Bibles, one of their guides to uh, help them uh, pass the test of Antietam to be a guide and uh, to help them use it as a constant reference. So this is free tomorrow. Uh, for anybody that uh, picks up Harvest Ferry Under Fire in September Suspense. So thanks all. I do hope, if nothing else, you'll stop in our bookstore and uh, at least uh, put a little of your uh, hard-earned cash there because that hard-earned cash is going to allow us to do things next year when the sequester is going to be even worse based on what we currently know. Um, it'll allow us to keep our park open and continue to offer good public programs. So I thank you in advance for giving me the opportunity to have that advertisement this evening. All right, George McClellan. Why would anybody in their right mind start a lecture with those two words? <laughs> George McClellan. George McClellan, I'll be right up front, makes my skin crawl. I don't like him. He, he would be the kind of person that I would hate to work for. He'd be the kind of person I could not trust. His ego is such that I would never be able to respect him. Sometimes he's an outright liar. Sometimes he's insubordinate. And he even has tendencies towards dictatorial power. He's a dangerous man, George McClellan is. He's dangerous. George McClellan has a lot of power. Oh yes, he has influence, especially with the Democratic Party. But we all know that if you have a choice between influence and power, you always choose power. Because with power you can help people and you can crush people. And that's what McClellan has. I will argue to you right now that the most powerful man in the United States of America in September of 1862 is not Abraham Lincoln. It is George McClellan. It is George McClellan. Now that is a vile thing to say about a, what in my mind is a vile man. However, now that you all know where I stand on George McClellan, 
Anybody, anybody out there doesn't know where I stand on Jordan McLeod? Are we clear? <laughs> Let me share a couple of things with you. Who wins this campaign? George McClellan. Very hard thing for us to acknowledge. Because most of us can't stand a man. It's very difficult to admit the victor was McClellan when we can't stand the victor. But Clellan's one of those people we love to hate. We love that. We love to bash McClellan. And you're going to hear plenty of it over the next few days. And when you, when you read about this campaign and the two most prominent books that cover the campaign, you probably have in your libraries. One of them is... The Gleam of Bayonets by James V. Murphy, which was published in 1964. It was the first full-scale contemporary study of the Maryland campaign. Jim Murphy was a native of Washington County, a native of Clear Spring. Jim unfortunately passed away much too young. He died in 1987, so he's no longer with us. But that was my Bible, Jim Murphy's book, The Gleam of Bayonets. You will not read much kind words about George McClellan and the Gleam of Bayonets. And the other one that most of you probably have in your collection is? Landscape Turned Red. Absolutely, Landscape Turned Red. Landscape Turned Red made Stephen Sears famous. That was Stephen Sears' real first foray into the literature of the American Civil War on a grand scale. I found out about Sears' book before it was published. The person that told me about it was Jim Murphy, because Murphy had read the original manuscript. That came out in 1983, 19 years after Murphy's volume. And Sears is even more angry at George McClellan. I use the word angry. What Sears does is a very interesting literary technique. And I suspect most of you don't realize that you actually have been a fool of Stephen Sears. Good writers make all of us fools when you read their works. They play you. And Sears does a great job of playing you right into the hands of the anti-McClellan theatrics and language. But what Sears does, which is a very cute trick, is throughout Landscape Turn Red, Sears inserts his opinion and makes you think it's fact. If you have that book with you, some of you probably brought it along with you, take a look at it over the next few days. Go back and read some passages. And look at some of those positions that he takes on George McClellan. And then you tell me what is fact versus what is opinion. It's brilliant the way that he puts the two together. And it makes you feel that George McClellan is a hopeless case as a human being. Almost un-American, in fact. But it's still, we can't get beyond the fact that the victor of the campaign is George McClellan. So I, with difficulty, want to share a couple of thoughts with you about where McClellan succeeds. First, what was the first Union, not Confederate, the first Union target, the first Union goal in the Maryland campaign, in the invasion of the North. What was the very first Union goal? Protect Washington. Protect Washington. Correct. That's obvious. But how do you protect Washington? How do you protect Washington? Now, for those of you that are familiar with the defenses of Washington, you would be able to say to me that the defenses of Washington made Washington the most fortified city on the planet in September 1862. And you are correct. The ring, the circle fortifications around Washington, no place on earth had more forts 
or more guns concentrated in one location as did Washington, D.C. in September 1862. But you know something? That's not how you protect Washington. That is not how you protect Washington. And McClellan knew that was not how he was going to protect Washington. What was Washington's greatest vulnerability? This was the true goal, the true target of Union strategy during the first week of September 1862. <coughs> silence, I hear silence. Oh, keep, keep Maryland. Accessibility. Oh. Railroads. It's all geography. Let me show you something. You don't see it on the map even. Yeah. Right here is Washington D.C. All right, right there. <coughs> this place is so insignificant in the history of the campaign it doesn't even appear on the map. But you all know it. You've all been there. In fact, many of you were there earlier today. Baltimore is the key to the protection of Washington. What do I mean by that? Well, let me share this analogy. You'll get it instantly. Why did U.S. Grant in 1864 focus vir virtually all of his energy on Petersburg? Railroad. The way to Richmond was through Petersburg. The way to Washington was through Baltimore. Was through Baltimore. All railroads, all railroads that went to Washington went through Baltimore. And so the very first target, the very first goal that George McClellan had when he took command of the Army of Potomac and put it out in the field was not what you read in Murphy and is not what you read in Sears. And who was the first who perpetuated this myth that George McClellan's real target was the Army of Northern Virginia? It wasn't Sears and it wasn't Murphy. And it wasn't George McClellan. And it wasn't Abraham Lincoln. No. No, this myth was really first commenced by Henry W. Halleck. And it is myth, my friends, it is contrived mythology that George McClellan's target was the Army of Northern Virginia. That is not true. We all know that George McClellan, as the president said, suffered from the slows. And when we talk about McClellan suffering from the slows, what we're referring to is that, other than the obvious, is that McClellan doesn't move aggressively against Lee once he's across the Potomac River. In fact, you will read in virtually any Antietam literature that George McClellan's army moves no more than six miles a day. What kind of force march is that? We would be able to walk six miles tomorrow if you want. But you see, they've all missed it. The reason that he was moving six miles a day is because the Army of Northern Virginia at Frederick, Maryland was not the target for the Union Army initially. The focus was not west and north. The focus was due north. McClellan had to seize and protect Baltimore, which was totally unprotected. There were no guns in Baltimore except for a few up on Federal Hill a few at Fort McHenry. There were no troops there. There were no regulars there. Baltimore was just like Petersburg was in June of 1864, virtually undefended, unprotected. And that's why Grant raced there in 1864 and, as you all know, came so, so close. McClellan did something Grant didn't. McClellan succeeds in getting to Baltimore cutting off any approach to Baltimore during the first and into the second week of September so that Baltimore was absolutely secure and only then was Washington safe. So McClellan at that point by September 11th of 1862 had achieved the first assignment that the President of the United States gave him which was to protect Washington via Baltimore. Done. Who did McClellan select for this important mission? Well, he's another one who um, often is uh, spoken with derision. 
His name is Ambrose Burnside. Why does McClellan choose Burnside for the most important assignment McClellan initially has? The answer is this, my friends, and I want you to keep this in mind. There's only one man in this army of nearly 90,000 in the field. Only one other man besides George McClellan who has ever commanded an army. And that's Ambrose Burnside. The other 89,998 have not. But Burnside has commanded an army. And has successfully in North Carolina in the campaign against the coast which what would soon become the Ninth Corps, and by this time has been established as the Ninth Corps. And so Burnside moves north with the army, and he races north to cut off the roads that approach Baltimore from Frederick, which is where Lee is. Lee, 40 miles, two-day march from Frederick to Baltimore. Two days, he's in Baltimore. Burnside cuts him off right here, right along this ridge. This was the first strategic target of the United States Army, that ridge line right there in Frederick County and Carroll County, Maryland. Notice there's a railroad that runs right through a gap. That's the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The Union holds it and all rails coming in from the north. So this ridge line right here is McClellan's first line of defense for Washington and Baltimore, high ground held by the Federals. McClellan's in a posture of defense, not offense, at this point. September the 11th, he communicates to the president that we now have Baltimore safe. At that point, McClellan begins moving his troops. Now notice, there are three blue prongs here. One hugs the Potomac River. That was to prevent additional Confederates from coming across the river. They were very concerned that if the Union Army moved this direction, there would be Confederates here that would come through the back door and cross the river somewhere towards Rockville, just like Jeb Stuart would do in 1863 during the Gettysburg Campaign. What's the name of the Ford, Marshal? What's the name of the Ford that Stuart would use in 63? Rousers. Rousers Ford. It was there in 1862, too. The Yankees knew that. And so Franklin, William Franklin's job was to ensure no crossings of the enemy across the river, which was another way to protect the back door into Washington. Good strategy by McClellan. And this central column here, which was the six mile a day column, was moving very slowly, basically as a hinge between the two wings of the army, Burnside's wing to the north and Franklin's wing to the south. So the two strategic wings are north and south. This is the glue that holds the two together. And that's the glue that people focused on. Sumner and his command, that wing, six miles a day. Wrong place to focus. That's number one. Second success by McClellan. McClellan's army will take Frederick. Of course, Lee's abandoned it, so there's no battle. Burnside's men will be the first to arrive in Frederick. Burnside and the lead, the most experienced commander in the army other than McClellan himself. What does George McClellan then do in Frederick? Well, all of you know about Special Order 191. But did you know that George McClellan intended to move towards the mountain, South Mountain, even before he had Special Order 191 in his claws? He didn't have to have it. Because, you see, McClellan's cavalry, under Pleasanton, had never been so aggressive as it was. What I mean by aggressive is it is out there looking for the enemy, searching for the enemy, trying to find the enemy. The enemy is on the home turf. Marshal's 8th Illinois is in the lead, looking for Robert E. Lee and the Confederates. And they know where they are without Special Orders 191. They know the rebels have left Frederick. They know the rebels have divided their army. They know the rebels have been moving towards Harper's Ferry. They know Harper's Ferry is isolated and cut off. They know that Lee's on the west side of the mountain in the Cumberland Valley. McClellan knows all of that before Special Orders 191 even shows up in his hand. Because the intelligence that he's receiving from Pleasanton and the cavalry and friends. My friends, you are in friendly territory for the first time during George McClellan's tenure as a commander. This is Yankee country. 
You're not in rebeldom here. This is northern country. Nine out of every ten people who live in this county and the county adjacent to us where Frederick is, they're Yankees. So McClellan is getting intelligence from the people who live here. Good intelligence. And they can tell them what roads the Confederates took. They can tell them how many cannon went through the villages of Middletown or Boonesboro or Williamsport. McClellan's getting all this information. One report, intelligence report, came back to McClellan that Jackson had crossed the river at Williamsport with almost 14,000 men. That was a Union intelligence report. Stonewall Jackson will tell you that during this command and three of his divisions, the three that crossed the river, he had almost 14,000 men with him. That's how precise the intelligence was. So McClellan has allies that are helping him here, and he's very confident that he can, he can accomplish his second mission. His second mission is, what is it? What's McClellan's second mission, his second charge from the President of the United States? He's already achieved the first one. Protect Washington. What is the second charge the President gives George McClellan in September 1862? Destroy the Confederate Army? Nowhere will you read that. Nowhere. Doesn't exist. There is nowhere that you will see Lincoln ordering George McClellan to destroy the Army of Northern Virginia. That is another one of these fabrications, and the principal source of that fabrication was Henry W. Halleck. So, no, not true. Somebody else mentioned what the real... Get them out, out, out of Maryland. Send them back home. We'll worry about what happens to the Army of Northern Virginia once they get back into Virginia. But let's get them out of Maryland. We must remove the rebels from Maryland. So, let's conclude with this. On September the 14th, we have another mountain range right here. The rebels are holding this mountain range, kind of, called South Mountain, running from the Potomac River, Weaverton Pass, right here. Harpers Ferry, Book Park, here's, here's the South Mountain, here's Weaverton Pass, here's Harpers Ferry, there it goes, right there. All right? So McClellan attacks the aggressor. He chooses Burnside to be the principal spear of the aggression, his most experienced commander. Burnside's going to be attacking all this area up here. He's going to send some of his army, this part nearest the river, to the river town of Harpers Ferry. This all makes good sense. What George McClellan intended was this, to break through South Mountain, race to the Potomac River, and cut off the rest of the army in northern Virginia, which is north of the river. I.e., this is Robert E. Lee up here with Longstreet and D.H. Hill and John Bell Hood. I mean, these, these people would be isolated, cut off, and McClellan can bust through the mountain and race to the river, Lee's trapped to the north. In the meantime, his second mission was to try to relieve the surrounding of Harpers Ferry, we can see all these red arrows, which of course is what Special Orders 191 was all about. So that was McClellan's mission on September the 14th. Crash through South Mountain, cut off Lee, don't let Lee get back across the river, and relieve the siege of Harpers Ferry. Well, strategically, we will say that McClellan failed. He did not reached the river before Lee. He did not cut him off. And we'll learn why, because of the fighting that occurred in South Mountain. And we also will learn that at Harpers Ferry, the column sent to Harpers Ferry also will fail to relieve the surrounding garrison. So strategically, George McClellan fails on September the 14th to achieve those two self-annoyed missions of his. However, the Battle of South Mountain itself was considered a great northern victory by McClellan and his peers and the men in the ranks. Great northern victory. I speak about this in September suspense. When you read the newspaper accounts of September 14, 15, 16, 17, before Antietam, everybody's focused on South Mountain. And the reason was 
that the Confederates were on the run. In other words, McClellan's grand strategy, which was to force the Confederates back into Virginia, was working. Lee had retreated from Hagerstown back to the river. McClellan victory. McClellan had forced two-thirds of the Confederate army to be pinned down on the Harpers Ferry area. Frozen. That is a Confederate failure. They weren't supposed to be frozen. McClellan has achieved that for the moment. Frozen. And McClellan himself and the army forcing Lee back to the Potomac have had the opportunity now to press him on back into Virginia and in the campaign, hence accomplishing the president's final mission. So what I'm trying to suggest to you in summary is this. George McClellan has had a very good two weeks. McClellan has had the best two weeks as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Everything he has achieved, the president is happy with. Happy with. Lincoln is ecstatic that Baltimore has been protected. Lincoln is ecstatic that the river has been guarded and that no more rebels can get across. Lincoln is incredibly ecstatic about the seizure of Frederick, a key communications rail link and road link here in western Maryland. From Frederick, the Union Army can go many different directions. It's got a radius. Lincoln's doubly pleased with McClellan's efforts, and so far with no loss. When Lincoln learns about the victory at South Mountain, he will send McClellan a message congratulating the Army on their great victory. This is Lincoln to McClellan. So what I'm trying to say is that prior to the Battle of Antietam, George McClellan has had success after success after success, and finally when Robert E. Lee shows up right there at Sharpsburg, McClellan has him on the ropes, meaning that George McClellan fully expects no battle. Let me repeat that. When the Confederate Army arrives at Sharpsburg, George McClellan is not expecting a battle. Because, why would he? Most of the Confederate Army is still here at Harper's Ferry where it has not yet succeeded. And Lee is two miles from the Potomac River with a ford behind him, an easy escape back into Virginia. And so from McClellan's perspective, on the night of September the 14th and the morning of September the 15th, where we're going to conclude our show right now, at dawn on the morning of September the 15th, the Confederate Army has been wrecked at South Mountain from George McClellan's perspective. Robert E. Lee has raced, fled in disarray from South Mountain from George McClellan's perspective. Harper's Ferry has not surrendered meaning the failure of Special Orders 191, another victory for McClellan, and we is two miles from the Potomac River with him, from McClellan's perspective, two miles back to the safety of Virginia. Ultimate, complete, final victory for McClellan and Union arms. Two miles from completion. Two miles from completion. Note, nowhere in the plan is there a battle scheduled along the Antietam Creek. <coughs> and this is where Robert E. Lee wrecks George McClellan's plans. <laughs> All right, everybody, get a good night's sleep, and we'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, 7.30, right, Mark?